Some of what we have to share with you this morning will uh, be a, a blessing to you as it, as it is and has been to us. So, as always, we, we open in prayer. Sorry for the fall there of our microphone or our camera. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you honor. We give you glory for all, Lord, that you are intended intended for our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're giving us a piece and a part of the building of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Father, that you have called us into the business sphere. You've called us to be in a place uh, that has been occupied for many centuries, Lord, to move into that space to bring your glory into that space. And we thank you and give you the glory and the honor for allowing us this great privilege. Lord, we thank you now that you have brought uh, you have brought us together uh, this morning for a purpose. Uh, we supernaturally recognize your strength and and what is being delivered here this morning. We receive it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> you can uh, sense the spirit of God in here. You can actually. You certainly can. Yeah. When I walked in the door. Thank you, Lord. Keller had the same experience. <laughs> This morning, he compared it to Praise Lord. something that has passed. That's some good stuff. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we, we, uh, we, we again thank you and honor you. And we start, Lord, with instruction that began a week or so ago in our spirits and continued this morning with an early morning awakening by your spirit and leading us to a word that Marsha Burns posted this morning on small straws and soft wind. And what Marcia said was honestly assess aspects of your life to see and know the relevance of your activities with regard to your kingdom position. Now that is an eye opener for all of us because we recognize that in, in building the kingdom of God, there is a very, very specific path upon which we take, but we also recognize that there are many diversions along that path to pull us out of and delay us. And, and that's part of recognizing that there is a defined ordered steps that we must take in order to fulfill what God's put us in the, on the planet to do. But we also recognize in, in going down these ordered steps that there are diversions there. So honestly assess aspects of your life to see and know the relevance of your activities with regard to your kingdom position. Now, those last three words are really, really important to your kingdom position. And if you ask God to cause you to recognize your kingdom position, you'll, be, you'll begin to understand that there are responsibilities in your kingdom position that may not allow you to go some of the places you've been, be with some of the people you've been with, and then do some of the things that you've done. And it's really been shaping me to understand that many of the things that have been traditional in my life are no longer traditional in my life. And one I will mention is I've been involved in local politics for 50 years or longer, maybe 60 of my 70 years in some way, shape, form, or fashion. That's not my kingdom position. It's not where I'm called to operate. So... So therefore, uh, I, I will continue to support local candidates and, and do that sort of thing, but I'm not called to the local political arena, and it's a tradition that I'm, I'm making a choice to break with because it's not in tandem with the position that I'm called to walk in in the kingdom. So again, this is a time to separate, this, listen to this, this is a time to separate the precious from the vile the positive from the negative and make the necessary adjustments. Every day away from my presence is a day wasted, says the Lord. You know the difference between good and evil and it's time to rearrange your priorities and choose to carry out my will and purposes. And the theme scripture this morning before we actually get into the teaching is Jeremiah 15, 19. And this is a scripture that very, very often Arthur Burke taught on. And this is what, what it says. It says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, if you return, 
then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me if you take out the precious from the vial. You shall see my, you shall be my mouth. What is that saying? That, that is saying that if we follow that divine path, God wants us to be oracles of, of, of his thinking. He wants us to be carriers of his kingdom. But in order to do that, we have a responsibility of knowing what our kingdom position is. And my kingdom position no longer allows me to get involved in, in, in local politics. Uh, other than you know supporting local candidates and voting for them, my, my, my engagement in that area is no longer a factor. It violates my kingdom position to do that. So there are other things in my life that violate my kingdom position. There are things in my family life. There are things in my work life that potentially violate my kingdom position and being aware of the fact and waking up to the fact that I've got to recognize diversions, I've got to recognize things that would pull me off path. Look, they may be innocent things. They may be things that we've done all our life, but God says this, therefore thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me if you take out the precious from the vial. Uh, another translation says the precious from the worthless, and that's what Arthur taught here many times is understanding there's a there's a defined path um just this morning on on our we have a facebook page called wisdom and in that are just sentences strung together that often bring about um a change in our life and uh, this the scripture that was posted or the wisdom post this morning, does anybody have that? I'm having a little difficulty pulling it up on my Facebook page for reasons I know not, but it's a, it's a word that I think sets into motion everything that we're doing here this morning. Um, do you have that, Mike? Um, from Charlie Martin? No, no, it's one I posted this morning. Um. Life without purpose is yes. lifeless. Life without purpose is lifelessness, <clears throat> as his purpose in all facets of our life is our highest order. His purpose in all facets of our life is our highest order. Proverbs 19, and if you look at Seven Mountain Teaching, Seven Mountain Teaching directs you to the highest facets of order in every facet of your life. Now that breaks it down into seven mountains, but in our individual lives, we've got family, we've got church, we've got our work, we've got all sorts of things that are part of an order that in, in order for us to fulfill that order, we must to live to the highest order, we've got to fulfill that to the fullest in all facets of our life. So, Going back again to Jeremiah 15, 19 and understanding that part of what God is saying is separate the precious from the worthless. Then let's move into the crux of what we're here to talk about today. And what we're here to talk about today is intentionality. Intentionality is a word that has been often used uh, by Lance Wall now and others describing um, a facet of faith and it's an incredibly strong facet of faith um, intentionality is to faith what movement is to aging if you've listened to any of the great health teachers of today they will prescribe diet in the aging process they will prescribe uh, particularly things that are that we need to connect to in terms of what we consume what we eat but the biggest factor in aging is movement. The biggest factor in aging is movement. If you choose to move as, as age comes upon you, then you will be given some longevity that you don't have if you're stagnant and still and don't move. So intentionality is to faith what movement is to aging. Atrophy is the result of not working faith or physical muscle. 
In other words, if you have no faith to operate, then it will atrophy just as muscle will atrophy in the aging process. Chandler and I, at one point, in a much younger stage of our lives, uh, had had some physical resilience, had some strength uh, to, to perform on a sports field. But those muscles that we had then are not necessarily with us today. But I think we both care about that. We tr both are trying to work that and, and trying to keep ourselves as strong as we can at 70 years of age. But it requires effort. So effort in the, in the physical realm is movement, whether it's lifting weights, running, walking, or, or whatever it is you do. But again, intentionality is to faith what movement is to aging. Atrophy is the result of not working your faith. Well, if you don't haven't heard God for what it is you're supposed to be doing, then you don't have any faith to work with because faith comes by the Word. And that Word does not necessarily and always come through the written Word. It could be the spoken Word of God to your heart that He wants you to do this or He wants you to be more faithful in, in matters of your family or He wants to be more faithful in, in matters of your work or whatever it is. And, and again, we're using the word work here kind of loosely because most of us here feel that this is what we're called to do and this is the arena that we're called to, to bring glory to God in. As we age, the body weakens, slows down, and energy levels drop. All right? In comparison to the body, and recognize Jesus often used the body metaphorically to teach us, as the body weakens with time, so does faith weaken. You might have a dream. You might have something that God's spoken to you. And that dream, over time, also weakens. Because often the dr dream takes time for it to manifest in your life. I think probably everybody in this room, probably everybody listening uh, to, to this teaching, has some sort of dream or some sort of faith option that they have on the inside of them and many of us have awaited that dream's manifestation but with age of the dream it too can weaken meaning that your faith can weaken exactly as 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 time passes but intentionality and i want to speak and declare that word in everybody's life this morning in, intentionality activates and awakens faith intentionality is when you're absolutely 100% committed to seeing this word come to pass in your life. It's when there are no, uh, there are no uh, obstacles, there are no hindrance, hindrances that, that are going to get over on your intentionality. Intentionality uh, activates and awakens faith. What does intentionality actually mean? It means deliberative, purposeful, direct, without allowing interference. It means putting a stake in the ground so hard and so fast that you're standing over that stake, you have hammered it in the ground, and you intentionally are sitting there with purpose in your heart that you will not be thwarted, you will not be overtaken, you will not allow any situation whatsoever to interrupt what God has put in your heart to do. It means you are committed beyond committed. It means you are absolutely deliberative and purposeful with your life every single day. And if God's dealing with me about a particular area of my life, say it's my marriage, He gives me some instruction of things to do. And I want to say to add to the heels of what we taught on last week, God is the God of inconvenience. Part of being deliberative is recognizing that you're going to be inconvenienced many, many times if you're in full obedience to what God's telling you to yes. do. That is, a, that is a fact. And if you don't know that, that, that God is the God of inconvenience, that much of your obedient <laughs> acts will not be because you want to do it, it will be because God is telling you. And if it didn't take some obedience, then obviously there wouldn't be any effort on our part. And what I'm trying to convey to you this morning is the power of the two parts of what God calls. He calls people to be connected to people. Uh, he causes supernaturally for connections to come to pass that create and cause things to happen in the realm of the spirit. In other words, you're not on a lone, you're not a lone ranger. You're not out there by yourself. You have connections 
and there's power and purpose in the connection. I, I enjoy the fact that my 21 year old daughter is getting her education because she feels connected to, to business. She, is, she changed her major, she's a business major, she's tackling some very tough subjects, but she feels in her heart of hearts that that's what God is telling her to do. And she's wrestled between that and Christian counseling. Well, as a father and a Christian, you know, I would probably want to steer my daughter to Christian counseling because it, quote, meets the objective of the Christian community. But knowing a deeper revelation, and that is that God calls people to different spheres. Many are called to be in the military. Many are called to, my brother is called to be the sheriff of this county. I believe that with all my heart. He feels that. Does that make him some kind of second class citizen because he's not wearing a collar around his neck or he's a missionary in, in Africa? No, absolutely not. Nor are we here in the business sphere some sort of second class. So if my daughter feels that in her heart, then so be it and accept it as the call of God. The greater privilege today is that I have my two sons working in and under the same roof that I work under because they feel connection and power to the purpose that God created them to fulfill as the people sitting at this table. Uh, we all feel we're joined to fulfill a specific purpose. Now, as we get deeper into what does intentionality release in us, we're, we're going to go take you to Acts 3, verses 6 through 8. And if you have time, turn to that in your Bibles because I think there's some real, real power in understanding the dynamic of connection you to someone else or to a group or to a people even. Because this is what God is doing in the earth today. He is connecting to create a functioning body. That's really important to understand. I would say today we, we have, we're gaining some power in the church, but we're not fulfilled in the church the way I think God wants us to be fulfilled because I think he, he's calling us to be a functioning church working together as one. We're so divided, we're so broken up in denominations, we're broken up into uh, races of people. If you just look at the church today, we're more divided than we are united. And I think what God is saying to us is he wants a united body so that we can fulfill as one what he wants us to do so that he can join the body to the head at some point in time. But at first, it is calling us to coagulate, to come together and to be one. All right, so as we as individuals take into account and we recognize that God has a plan for our life and he has a purpose for our life, and I think we went over this in pretty good detail, uh, in last week's teaching about God prepared works beforehand for us to attend to. I mean, before the foundation of the earth, he created works for his people to attend to. Acts 17, 26 says he even chose the times and the places that we should live. So if you understand your appointed time, you're here by time, you're here in place to fulfill a purpose that he prepared beforehand for you to attend to. And, and I don't know how many millions of people don't understand that one simple point, and I confess I didn't until deeper into my walk with the Lord did I understand that there was a specific purpose that I'm called to attend to. And I will never find joy or happiness or peace outside of exactly what God called me to do. Intentionality is a joint vision and purpose Marrying together, operating as one, more than one person. It can be a people or it can be a person. It can be a group. It can be a company. It can be a church. It can be a mission field. It can be any number of things. But understand the power is in the connection. But if you don't have folks who are, who are understanding intentionality with the calling, then they will never join. So we've got to break faith down. Faith Intentionality is to faith what movement is to aging. We have to be intentional with what God has placed in our heart. Now going to Acts 3 verses 6 through 8. Gold and silver have I none, but such as I have I give you. Stand up and walk in Jesus' name. 
This is Peter's command to the lame beggar who had been lame perhaps all his life. He had been part of a, a lower echelon of society. He was a nobody in the eyes of society. He was a beggar who had been in that position begging with no hope, no walk, no connection to anything. But look what happened to him. Peter reached out and took him by the right hand. That's what connection does. Connection reaches out and grabs those by the right hand that he's called to lift up and immediately what happened, his feet and ankle bones gained strength. So that's, what, that's a two-part equation. There was one lifting his hand out. There was another who needed this help. But immediately when the two came together, I maintain that the beggar had to put some pressure on his legs. He had to exercise some measure of faith to put some pressure on his legs to stand up when he'd never been able to walk. But immediately when the two came together and they both exercised faith, there was an intentionality on both parties' part and they were intending to do what God said do. Look what happened. A miracle took place. And his feet and ankle bones, which had never had strength, gained strength. Why? Because they put pressure on what God said and God delivered. So look at what the beggar did. He leaped up, stood, and walked, and listen to this part, entered the temple with them. So all of a sudden, here's, two, here's the apostle, Peter, uh, one, one of the most acknowledged men of God in his day. And suddenly this beggar who had been nobody and nothing in a very stagnant place, living a, 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 a life that had no value to it, he suddenly leaped up and where did he go? He went into the temple with them. With them, meaning he is now part and parcel to what they're doing. Walking, leaping and praising God. Yes. Joint effort. Let me say that word again. Once you know in your heart and you've got intentionality to fulfill what God's called you to do, understand that this was a two-party miracle. There was a beggar and there was Peter. Joint effort. That's the body learning to function as one. When you intentionally connect to the people that you're called to connect with to fulfill the purpose you're called to walk in, there's intentionality with that. Now, it doesn't stop there with just joining those people. That intentionality goes into you taking into account a mind of excellence. That means that you are now in the service of the Almighty God. You deserve to give your gift so that God can in turn give you His gift. And your gift is your best. You cannot sacrifice your best. You've got to give intentionality to giving your best to what it is God's called you to do. You can't give second best. You can't give half effort. You can't give part effort. You have to give your absolute finest effort because you're not working as unto man or working as unto any company. You're working as unto the Lord. And if you understand that when you find your purpose, your work is not unto any man, your work is unto the Lord, no matter what that assignment is. Intentionality is joint vision and purpose marrying together. Please understand that. Operating as one. You played the, the right hand he extended as a sign of fellowship. In other words, when we uh, come together with somebody that we're in fellowship with. We extend our right hand of fellowship. And that's what he did to bring him in to that place with them. Praise God. Yes, because they walked into the temple. Exactly. As one. And so what is God doing? He is, he is bringing his body together. He's bringing purpose in that body. He's allowing us to bring our gift, lay it on the table with each other, and allow us to come together as one and learn how to function as the body of Christ. That is a willingness to defer to each other's strengths and weaknesses. It's a willingness to lay our lives down for each other. You know, uh, uh, in, in understanding this teaching, I, I listened to a testimony 
couple of nights ago, and it was uh, one after another after another of soldiers sharing their hearts, some of them Medal of Honor winners. Uh, some, there's a great series about Medal of Honor winners on YouTube. And the one thing that hit me is that these guys who are in the most diabolical of circumstances, and that's war, when they're in war, they lay their lives down for each other. They're not thinking necessarily about the mission. They're not thinking necessarily about the enemy. They're not even thinking necessarily about their country or why they're there. But if you hear one after another after another, they lay their lives down for each other. They don't leave anybody behind. They'll go back to get a body. They will sacrifice their lives not to leave that one behind. That should be a great symbolic message to the body of Christ. We should be like as they are, great soldiers, and lay our lives down and be willing and purposeful and intentional to do everything we can to protect our brothers and sisters, to lift them up, and to be at work as one together. Again, intentionality is joint vision and purpose, married together, operating as one. Nick Saban, the great Alabama football coach, said the other night on a TV show called Rolling with the Tide, he said, the more people you get to see the same thing, the greater your chances for success. And so what this is, is casting the vision. And the vision is to see a functioning body. The vision is to see the body of Christ come together as one to integrate collectively in function and purpose uh, such that the Holy Spirit can lead us as a people, not as a person. We've had so much emphasis on teaching us to be led as a person or as an individual now what I believe is being released is us learning to hear the Holy Spirit as a group, to hear the Holy Spirit as a body, to hear the Holy Spirit in, in terms of, of, of us working together. Arthur Burke famously said for years and years and years, the one man show is over with. And what he saw, what he foresaw, even back into the 30s, I believe, was that there would come a day where the one man there would not be one man leading a bunch of people it would be a bunch of people functioning as a body and i think that's where god's collectively leading us to today to collectively integrate function and purpose and function and purpose and, and, and allow the holy spirit to connect us and join to individual parts uh recognizing that we're much more as a, as parts of the body than we are as individuals. I think part of the enemy's strategy is to keep us isolated, keep us segmented, keep us separated. There's no power in separation. In fact, uh, the, the, Satan is the father of division. God is the God of unity and oneness. That is our strength. So finding things in common purpose uh, and finding things that we can join and collectively do together is part of this understanding of, of intentionality. The sum of the parts is much greater individually and collectively when connected to the exact body part it's called to connect to. Recognizing in this dynamic one and one is not two, it's ten. One can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. What are we talking about? We're talking about the government of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven and that is a people not a person. We have to recognize we're called as a people. We're not called as a person. Yes, we are called as a person, but we're more now called as a people because God is wanting us to understand that this is not about me. This is about us. This is not a joining for, for the sake of joining, but rather specific parts called to join, enabling the body to function and specific God-assigned purpose. This is not a joining for the sake of joining, but rather specific parts called to join, enabling the body to function in God-assigned purpose. The, the, Jesus used the body to explain purpose to us, and it was, it was used, it was used in, in, in parallel with what the truth is. Parts function in specific unison. And, and it, is, it, it is that functionality, it is that exact thing that God is wanting us to wrestle with, to, to come to an understanding that there's intentionality 
with this call. There's very specific purpose in what we're called to do in every facet of our life. But in order to do that, we've got to first recognize we've got to separate the precious from the worthless. We'll never fulfill going through that filter and separating the precious from the worthless. And if you examine the activities of your life in different spheres, you will see some precious and you will also see some worthless. And if you're man enough or woman enough or called enough or feel the power of God enough to begin to separate those things that are not in keeping with your kingdom assignment, look what it what the end of that scripture says. He will use you as his mouth. So that what is there's no higher calling on the planet than to be used as God's mouth because that means he's given you part of his mind. He's given you a revelation of his kingdom because now he's going to allow you to be his mouth. Well, who is that? That is the one who has separated the precious from the worthless. I had, uh, being just very, very honest, I had some things in my life that I felt like were hindering me to go further into the kingdom of God. I knew what those things were. And it serves no great purpose for me to go into detail, but I would probably venture to say there are others that hear this teaching that would admit that as well. And so I knew what those two things were. God had been dealing with me about those two things, and I go sit in a barber chair and get a haircut in October of 2013, and a prophet was cutting my hair, and the prophet said, very specifically, God is telling me there are two things that he's been saying to you and speaking to you that you must address and get with. You must separate the precious that he's called you to from the worthless. You must separate the vile from that that is pure. I knew exactly what she was saying. Uh, and so I repented. Uh, I, I acknowledged it. I repented of, of those things. And I'd like to sit here and tell you that I had the strength and the power to not go back and revisit those two things again, but I did not for whatever reason, and it held me back tremendously until I truly, honestly, and forthrightly put it on the table and allowed God to begin to separate the precious from the worthless. And this is a daily occurrence, not just with those two things, but other diversions will try to come into your life. If you've got a great calling and you've got a great purpose on this planet, you can trust they're going to come diversions. It ain't always going to come in the form of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's obvious. We know that ain't of God. We know that. But what can it come in? It can come in an innocent appearing thing. It can come in something that you've traditionally done all your life. I know people that are out of balance, completely, totally out of balance with their habit or their addiction to golf. I know people that are out of balance with their addiction to hunting. So I, I'm not coming down on that. I think there's a place for all that, but I know that if it's not in balance, it can be a vile thing. It needs to be separated from the precious thing. So I'm not talking to everybody here, but I'm talking to, to the people that feel that they're called to glorify God, to walk in the depths of the kingdom, and to, and to bring the kingdom to earth. Those that feel pinned up and, and, uh, and sort of out of sorts with where they are and what they're doing, I want this message to give them hope that if you feel that you're not to be where you are, that there's something else for you to do. Uh, Mike Croft left a 19 and a half year stable job with a great company here in Liberty County to come and be part of a fledgling solar company. That took enormous courage to leave that kind of st stability and step into something that had really no natural hope to fulfill anything. But his vision in him was stronger than the circumstance that he appeared to be looking at. So that's where it takes courage. That's where it takes a, a lot of honor to, to create and follow intentionality. Uh, Dickey at age 73, uh, fighting all kinds of medical conditions in his life is taking great courage for him to get up and, and, and step up and fulfill what God's telling him to do now. 
uh, it's going to require a lot of intentionality on his part. It's going to require a lot of energy, a lot of inconvenience to be able to fulfill what he's called to do. Interestingly, Lance Walnow pointed out in, in our conference a couple of weekends ago that God's doing mighty things in 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and 50-year-olds preparing them for what their walk will be when they're 60 year olds, 70 year olds, and 80 year olds. He, he, he mentioned that those who have this calling that are in their later years are not called to sit down and retire. They're now called to stand up and do what God's used all these years to refine and teach them. When you take into account Joseph was in the darkest, stinkiness, nastiest, he wasn't in the prison, he was in the dungeon. The dungeon's underneath the prison for 22 years. 22 years, yet he had a dream in his heart. He, had, he knew that he was going to fulfill some great plan that God had for him. Can you imagine the discouragement and the despair of being in the darkest, stinkingest, nastiest dungeon and have a dream like that? that know that one day you're going to fulfill something more powerful than anything you, you could ever imagine. And I think we all sitting here, maybe even people listening to this teaching, have a dream. But if they don't recognize it, they're going to go through a period of contradiction where it will look like anything but that dream is ever going to come to pass. You're going to go through that dark dungeon period. It's part of your refining. It's part of the process. Yes. Uh, Nick Saban Again, using the coach as an, uh, in analogous terms, he talks about his players learning the process. The process means you've got to you've got to you've got to walk through to get to. There's there's pain in this. You got to understand that part of it. And unfortunately, in the 80s, we learned had a lot of teaching that said that if you're going through anything, it's because you don't have enough faith. What a what a bad what a bad trip to send people on. Um, yeah, right. It was a, it was a, it was, it was a word of faith that got totally out of balance with understanding that trials and tests are part of the process that's necessary to go through the refinement so that you can be of some use to the Father. One word, hope. Hope, absolutely. Acts fourteen twenty two. Mike, would you read that? <clears throat> fourteen twenty two. Strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom, to enter of, God. The kingdom of God. So what is that saying? That there's a, there's a gateway to the kingdom. What is the gateway to the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Hardships. Yeah. It's difficulty, it's setbacks, it's trials, it's, it's discouragement to the point of you wondering if you're even saved. That's normal. But if you don't know that's normal, you don't know that you're going to be challenged like that, you can question whether or not God even knows who you are. And to use that, the hardships, to strengthen and encourage them to remain true to the faith. Yes, yes. And Don't waste your trials. It wasn't the victory, the success, the touchdowns to make it. It was, look, this is going to be hard. And that was the encouraging word to strengthen the disciples to remain true to faith. So as we, as we wrap this up, uh, let's again visit the word intentionality. Intentionality, again, is knowing in your heart of hearts what it is that God has spoken the loudest to you about fulfilling. That is the knowledge that, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do. You may not know what you're supposed to do in all areas, but there will be several areas you will absolutely know what God is telling you to do. Now, if you accept that, then please accept the fact that intentionality means that you are not going to be separated from what you're called to do. You, are, you have stepped up to the place with a commitment. Intentionality is commitment. It is a true commitment. And it demands excellence. It doesn't demand half-hearted efforts. 
It doesn't demand a partial effort. If you want to give your gift, that demands excellence, then God will give His gift. Whatever we sow is whatever we reap. If we come to work or we come to where our calling or the mission field or wherever we're called, we give a half effort, then we're going to receive a half effort back. And what God said with intentionality, which is true commitment, let's demand excellence of ourselves. If we're not willing to give that excellence, then we're not willing to give our gift. We're not living in intentionality. We're just going through the motions. And, and I have been a man called of God for many, many years, but I have not given God my best. I have wasted a lot of time and I've wasted a lot of years not being intentional about what God's called me to do. We don't need to waste those years. You young people particularly do not need to waste years playing games. Get intentional because intentionality activates and awakens your faith. When you give it that extra effort, if, 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 if in your heart you're, you're told on a Saturday morning that you're planning to go somewhere else and God tells you to do something completely contrary to your plans, as you yield yourself and give yourself over to the Holy Spirit, He'll begin to use you more and more and more because now He can trust you in matters that are inconvenient to you. And trust me, this call will be inconvenient. The apostles were killed for what they believed. They were stoned. They were packed to death. John the Baptist lost his head for what he believed. You know, we're not being necessarily called to give up our life in a physical sense, but we are called to give up our life in a spiritual sense. And that means that if I'm going one place on Saturday and the Holy Spirit directs me to another, I have to be willing to die to me and what I want to go where He wants. And it won't take but a few of those times where you'll start developing a rhythm that'll come as a result of yielding to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And before you know it, He'll be using you in a function and a capacity that's almost remarkable, if not supernatural. It is supernatural. It is. It is. Our, our tendency or our, our, what we do here is we, when we finish with the word, we go around and we let anybody that cares to contribute to what we've said to add to it. And I'll, I'll just start with you, Dickie. Well, I believe that God is saying to the body of Christ that now is the time to pour out your heart to Him and allow His Spirit to to fill you up in such a way that you can fulfill what God has called you to do. That we are in a season that demands that we give God our best. Uh, you know, for many years we gave Him what was left over. But now God is saying, if you want to fulfill your calling, that you need to, to, to lay everything down and enter into that rest that He's called you to be in. And the intentionality that Clay's been talking about is exactly where we as a body have to go. We have to, to find God is God's intention for us and zero in on that and follow that leading. Would you say, Dickie, if you've been in the church for many years, would you say that lack of intentionality has contributed to the weakness of us as a church as a body uh, even as in, in us as individuals certainly it, um, you know in myself I know uh, I've gone through periods where I was very intent on what I felt like God was telling me but I was uh, lackadaisical about a lot of things and I had not come to that place to lay everything down and just what you're talking about before there uh, where God is saying separate those things from your life that are not of me and, and give me that purity of your heart. And, and that's where he's calling us. It, you know, it's like uh, he will tell you what you need to lay down. Yes, he will. And he will be very clear about it. He, you know, he, he's very uh, precise about certain things. And that's one of them. And when he tells you, well, I think, and we can make no mistake about it, if we don't lay those things down, it will hinder us. It will delay what God has planned for our lives. And if we just know that, that's a fact. And that's an absolute fact. And I've lived long enough now to know that I have hindered what God's wanted to do in me because I chose to hang on to things that I didn't need to hang on to. 
and 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 then yeah. you know again it doesn't have to be some wickedly obvious thing that I'm talking about it can just be gossip it can be murmuring it can be any number of things that God's dealing with you about to give up and let go because you don't need that delay keeping you from the fullness of what God has in your life yes. Suzanne yes it's definitely an awareness it's a, it's an awakening uh, and I, I have a testimony to that effect I'm, I'm still work in progress um, the, the three things that hit me the most is the committed being committed, having deliberate acts, and, and purposeful in where you're going. And that's the most important thing. When you start following that, there is hope. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, the, the vision part alone, I mean, God puts that vision inside of you, and it's hidden for so long. And then when, when you're awakened, you light up, because then you know. You know where you're supposed to be going. Yes. Praise God. Yep. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, <clears throat> God does honor commitment, but what we need to realize, because he'll honor whatever commitment you commit to, and if it's self-worth, you'll get that, but there's no satisfaction in that, so you're supposed to commit to Jesus, and so if you sow into Jesus, you'll receive the kingdom blessing, if you sow into yourself, you'll receive earthly things, uh, so when you're committed and, and dad says God is the, the God of inconvenience when you're committed to Jesus there is no inconvenience I mean you might feel com uncomfortable physically but when you're committed to Jesus there is no inconvenience it's just you just go so that's that's what I think anyways it's good man Mike <laughs> Yeah, I, um, just to amen on the inconvenience portion because I've, as of the last couple of weeks, I've had some tests and tribulation that were just strictly to be inconvenient, and and what was on the other side of them was 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 the blessing that, that to recognize that. But uh, there's a similarly there between the body and the parts that I res really resonated with me about my 19 years in chemical engineering, and an exothermic reaction takes two grams of this catalyst, three grams of this catalyst, a half a gram of this catalyst, seven grams of this catalyst, and whether they're TBHP, iron, whatever they are, they're just little small parts. And, and it, in retrospectively looking at the body and how the pieces make this one big thing function, I could take less than a half a pound of dry chemicals and I can place them in together with specific order and the finished product of that re is exothermic reaction in my world was polyacrylamide was a then half a pound of dry chemicals turned to a 33,000 pound chemical reactions it just and of course that's chemistry taking place but it's the specific order of the little things and how they come together and then I really and, and again I, you can watch and manifest this little thing grow to his 33,000, most of them were 33,000 pounds. We used 15,000 kg, 15, kg reactors. Um, and it just really resonated about the, the, the pieces of the body and how they're implemented in the order which they're put together, that the sum of the parts is, is much greater. That, that catalyst alone had no bearing to the reaction. But in its specific order, which it, when it was added, now I've got a 33,000 pound and would fill this room. I mean, a handful of chemicals, when put together, filled would would make a reaction the size of this room, and so I'm really resonating about the parts of the body, which we call them fingers and hands and ears. But where he just spoke to me this morning was just that exceedingly abundantly above and beyond was little granular, half a gram here, a few grams of this, a few grams, and those are catalysts, those are pieces. But in the specific order which they were put in what the end product was, was a ginormous big block of gel that, you know, now we got to grind up and we got to package and the whole rest of the process. But uh, um, and that was just on me this morning. And you just give me similes of things that, that resonated me with my past of how those little things that eat the vine, that clog the filters, the hanging chads, but if they're systematically put with God's order and plan, they come together, what they can unfold in, in their size and enormity. Yeah, um, good. Yeah. Uh, 
I would close out by saying the word little things is a very, very important part of this teaching that the scriptures teach us. And one of the things that Arthur shared with us as a characteristic of the kingdom of God, he said, he, he taught from the scripture, despise not small beginnings. Those are little things. Despise not small beginnings. He said that is a characteristic of the kingdom. Everything that is of kingdom origin will start small as a seed and it will grow and become and you will not know how. It will grow exponentially. I think where, where many of us get hung up is, is we don't, in, in the business sphere, we don't walk in and make some giant deal. Well, he wants us to start small. He, he wants us to grow as he allows us to grow. So small things we talked about last week as being a negative, small things in the kingdom sense are also a positive because that's where he begins his work in the kingdom is something very small that starts small and grows exponentially large. It is, in a kingdom sense, it is making something out of nothing. And, and God loves to make something out of nothing because faith is the substance of things hoped for, but it's the evidence of things not yet seen with the naked eye. You can't see yet what faith requires, but recognize faith is an absolute substance. It is the substance. It actually has substance because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So your faith actually has substance to it. When you put it in operation, it begins to work. It begins to create and it pulls out of the unseen realm into the seen realm and it manifests itself. Most of the time as a small Look at the body again being used metaphorically as a baby, and it grows. I could say for Coastal Solar, we started much as a baby. We're probably in our young teenage years now in terms of evolution as a body part. Uh, we're learning. We're learning how we don't have to be, we don't have to have our diaper changed uh, every three or four times a day now. We don't have to milk feed. We're starting to learn how to operate more maturely than we did in the past, but that's been our evolution as a body, as a body part. Well, I'm gonna close out today uh, in prayer, and I'm gonna ask Dickie to close us out and to speak and declare a, a prophetic word over us as the Lord would lead him to speak prophetically, not only to us here, but to those in the body of Christ who are, who are listening to, to this teaching, which will be We'll be on Facebook. Uh, you, you'll be able to revisit this on Facebook in, the, in what, what we call the after view of the live broadcast. It'll also be posted on Lighthouse Prophecy at lighthouseprophecy.com on the internet here in the next day or two. So Dickie, if you don't mind praying and speaking prophetically as the Lord leads. Father, we just thank you right now for this word and we believe that we receive it right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the the faith that you've placed in each one around this table here. And Father, for all of those who are listening and who will listen to this, I pray right now that an anointing would go forth and you would be able to grasp this by the Spirit of God and be able to understand what God is saying to you that it's time to reach out in faith and say, stand up in the name of Jesus. And God is speaking to His body and and saying come together as one come together and speak the word of god over your situations reach your right hand out of fellowship and say be done in the name of jesus be healed in the name of jesus come into the kingdom in the name of jesus and father we thank you right now for your anointing and for the power that you've given us by your spirit and we just ask you now father that each one that's watching this that it would go forth into their spirit, Father, and that they would touch many people by the power of your spirit. And Father, we forever and ever and ever give you glory and honor and praise in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The end.